Ladies and gentlemen, in my yesterday's lecture, I tried to summarize in what ways Indian oceanography has progressed during the last two and a half decades and in what manner we are going to use the ocean for our growing needs in the future. In today's lecture, I would like to draw your attention towards another area of the ocean sector which has enhanced the prestige of India considerably and this is the Indian Antarctic program. The continent of Antarctica which has hitherto remained least known has been attracting the attention of scientists largely from the developed countries. Several expeditions had been undertaken in the past to know more and more about Antarctica which has often been referred to as the windiest, coldest and the stormiest of all the continents in the world. The development of Antarctic science is linked with the earlier adventure and explorations. Antarctica, the seventh continent of the earth, which covers an area of approximately 13.9 million square kilometers, one-tenth of the earth's land surface is known to be the coldest and the most inaccessible of all the continents. It is much larger than India and China put together or the United States of America and Europe combined. In summer month, there is continuous light for several months followed by this continuous darkness for several Africa. months during the winter. More than 95% of the continent is covered with ice. Although man landed on Antarctica more than seven decades ago, his studies have largely been confined to the areas where he landed and where he built his bases of observations. This is because man in Antarctica is largely dependent on the supplies he carries with him. This is unlike the Arctic where man can live by obtaining food from the environment and there has been a native population of Eskimos in the Arctic for centuries. The Antarctic continent is almost lifeless. It has an area of 14 million square kilometers, most of which is covered with an ice sheet of 1.6 kilometer of average thickness, varying for a maximum of 4.5 kilometers to a minimum of 800 meter. There is about a very large area amounting to 512,000 square kilometers of landmass which is free from ice. If the Antarctic ice were to melt, it would raise the world oceans by about 60 meters in height. The Antarctic continent is 990 kilometers away from Cape Horn, the southernmost tip of Chile in Latin America, which is the nearest land area to Antarctica. Antarctica's highest mountain is 5,140 meters above the mean sea level. India is separated from Antarctica by a continuous stretch of 9,360 kilometers of water of the Indian and Antarctic Ocean with no landmass in between. The ice sheet in Antarctica which originated millions of years ago and has continued since then completely undisturbed by melt and freeze phenomena is an excellent repository 
of things which fall on it and particularly the meteorites and other cosmic bodies. According to one reference, more than 5,000 meteorites have been found so far, many of them surfacing on glaciers after being preserved uncontaminated under the ice for millions of years. The Antarctic ice sheet also provides samples of nuclear products of cosmic rays, entrapped air and minerals, and scientists from the world over are experimenting to study and decipher these mysteries which undoubtedly provide records of global and cosmic changes over the past millennia. The Antarctica represents a stable situation affected only by global climate and therefore offers a reference standard to separate different sets of information on global weather. This is a matter of great scientific importance to India which could be related to the monsoons. The southern marine ecosystem as the Antarctic region is generally referred to is one of the richest areas where varieties of seals, whales, penguins, this birds and fish of all types are found. Millions of tons of krill, a tiny protein rich shrimp like creature are found in such enormous swamps that they color the Antarctic waters brown during the summer season. Krill is already being harvested by some nations as human, poultry and cattle feed. Primitive forms of algae that grow under the ice and sometimes in the lakes in almost total darkness at sub-freezing temperatures and practically without exposure to air are also abundant. It is now well established that Antarctica is rich in a multiplicity of mineral resources including the hydrocarbon and natural gas, that is petroleum products. But the present estimates of mineral ore are imprecise as the geological research is largely in a reconnaissance stage. There are, however, clear indications that the exploration and exploitation of the Antarctic mineral may become a possibility during the next century. Apart from the promising possibilities and challenges which the Antarctic continent holds for scientific investigations and economic gains, there is yet another aspect which is of great significance. Antarctica occupies an important place in the geopolitical map of the Indian Ocean. Its military and its strategic value is very clear. Geopolitics in the Indian Ocean therefore in reality addresses itself to a number of related interdependent aspects of which Antarctica is one. The There's concept of the Indian the Ocean as a zone of peace implies and recognizes the status of Antarctica as an integral part of the Southern Indian Ocean. And we believe that the Southern Indian Ocean ends in Antarctica. There cannot be peace in the Indian Ocean if there is conflict or confrontation on and around the Antarctic and vice versa. For India, the Indian Ocean is the most vital sea area. India has to ensure that the Indian Ocean does not become a preserve of any particular power. The waters in the southern extremities of the Indian Ocean close to the Antarctic forms such a geopolitical reality which is characterized by the lack of human habitation on islands and the virtual absence of traffic. Nevertheless, the Indian Ocean holds a great promise of meeting these needs in time. Why Antarctic research is important? Antarctica is an important location for observing the interaction of the Earth's magnetic fields and the charged particles from the sun. As you all know, the magnetic field near the pole is the maximum. The North and South Poles maintain the heat budget of the world in balance. 
if there would not have been so much ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic, the world climate would have been very different than what it is today. The waters of the Atlantic, Indian and the Pacific Oceans merge around Antarctica, forming a distinct body of water which girdles the earth and remains uninterrupted by any landmass. This is the most stormy part of the world ocean and is called the Roaring Forties. Antarctica provides a distinct, unpolluted and stable environment for carrying out scientific observations. Therefore, it forms a reference point for all types of pollution studies. Unlike the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, which communicate to both North Pole, that is Arctic, and the South Pole, that is Antarctic, the Indian Ocean has its northern boundaries closed with landmass. It therefore communicates only to the Antarctic Ocean from which it derives most of its fertility and energy. Many important oceanographic features of the Indian Ocean are governed by the Antarctic Ocean. Hence, to understand the processes occurring in the Indian Ocean, the knowledge of that part of the Antarctic Ocean which joins the Indian Ocean becomes very necessary for us. In the Mesozoic era, that is some 250 million years ago, the supercontinent of Gondwana land had a common landmass of five continents, namely Africa, Antarctica, Australia, India, and South America. Later, the continents drifted apart with the oceans in between, and Antarctica thus can tell many things about the Earth's history. There has been a growing interest in the resources, potential living and non-living, in the Antarctic and its surrounding areas. A mineral regime has been finalized recently. Indian scientific research and activities have contributed significantly towards the finalization of the minerals regime. I will briefly describe the Indian expeditions to Antarctica. Within a few weeks after the establishment of the Department of Ocean Development, it was asked to organize the first Indian expedition to Antarctica. The decision to undertake an expedition was taken in July 1981 by the late Prime Minister Shrimati Indira Gandhi and within five months the expedition was on its way to Antarctica in December. Thus all the arrangements were completed in less than five months at our disposal. The first expedition was carried out on a chartered Norwegian icebreaker Polar Circle. A team of 21 scientists coming from seven different organizations represented the various disciplines of the Antarctic science to be pursued. I had the proud privilege of leading this expedition. We started on 6 December and after facing great difficulties and our fourth attempt, we broke through the very thick pack ice and finally landed on Antarctica on 9th January 1982. During this expedition, an unmanned weather station, Dakshin Gangotri, was established in Antarctica. This expedition also laid the foundation of Antarctic research or what is called polar research in India. Since then, the country has organized seven more expeditions and in this way, Antarctic research has been continued and there has been a considerable development of infrastructural facilities in Antarctica for carrying out round-the-year investigations. The second expedition to Antarctic was participated by 28 scientists and officers from 12 different organizations. It surveyed and identified an area for setting up a permanent station and demarcated a suitable airstrip on ice. It also established a direct communication link between the base camp on Antarctica and India by telephone. These two expeditions led to considerable enhancement of India's capabilities of undertaking tasks under most difficult conditions. Subsequently, 
India joined a select group of 15 countries in the world as an Antarctic consultative party. India was elected as a member of the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, which is known as SCAR, unanimously. India also joined the Commission on the Conservation of Marine Living Resources of Antarctica uh, the same year. The third expedition was launched on a chartered ice breaker come supply vessel from Finland called Finn Polaris and was joined by 83 persons including two women scientists. It constructed the building for the first permanent Indian station Dakshin Gangotri and equipped with all the essential services like power, water supply, heating, sewage disposal, recreation center, hospital, etc. The first satellite communication link between India and Antarctica was established during this expedition. After the summer team finished its work, the first wintering team of 12 persons was left behind in Antarctica to continue their experiments and studies during the Antarctic winter, which is the most severe period of Antarctica. The fourth expedition to Antarctica also included 83 persons from 19 different organizations this on Finn Polaris. It strengthened the Dakshin Gangotri base further by constructing a garage, a workshop, emergency accommodation for survival, and three cottages on ice-free areas and established another direct high-frequency communication link between Dakshin Gangotri and India. During the past three years of the seventh plan, four more Antarctic expeditions, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth were launched. These expeditions undertook intensive exploration and conducted studies in various disciplines of Antarctic science. The fifth Indian expedition was sent on Thula land, a Swedish ice breaker come supply vessel with 88 members on board. In this team also there were two women scientists and one of them, Dr. Aditi Pant from Goa, was there for the second time. Apart from the very large coverage of scientific studies, the expedition was also given the responsibility to make a survey for locating a suitable site at the Sri Machar Hill Range for the construction of another station during the subsequent expeditions. This expedition also had the third wintering party of 14 persons to relieve the second wintering party after 15 months of safe living and working hard in very harsh and difficult conditions of Antarctica. Scientific studies were further extended to some of the most essential aspects for successful living in Antarctica. These included performance evaluation, resistance of microbes to cold, indoor horticulture, use of mineral tablets, problems of structural engineering, telecommunication problems, study of the health of the material used for construction in Antarctica and of human health. The sixth Indian expedition to Antarctica was also launched on Thula land with 90 members on board including 17 this member party for the fourth wintering team. Apart from continuing these studies in the major thrust areas such as geology, <coughs> geophysics, meteorology, biology, oceanography and geomagnetism, the logistic task such as the maintenance and repair of Dakshin Gangotri and Maitri camp buildings were also carried out. The seventh Indian expedition to Antarctica was also launched on Thula land with 92 members including 77 members from the summer team and 15 members for the wintering team. The fourth wintering party which was left behind accomplished all its tasks in Antarctica and was brought back by the seventh expedition and the fifth wintering party was left behind. The eighth expedition completed the construction of the new station Maitri, which is one of the largest stations in Antarctica today, the foundation of which was laid during the seventh expedition. The fifth wintering team was replaced by a sixth wintering team, which really included wintering team of 42 members, one at Dakshin Gangotri and the other at Maitri to carry out the work uh, on geology, magnetic surveys, climatology, studies on ozone hole, and solar radiation, trace gases, oceanographic and geomagnetic studies, etc. The ninth expedition will be launched in November 1989. The second Indian station with better living and working facilities will be available during the 88-89 season 
for the Antarctic scientists. I will say a few things about the Antarctic Treaty. Antarctica has remained an object of scientific curiosity for several decades. Scientific investigations on Antarctica began with the beginning of 1957-58, which is the International Geophysical Year, IGY. And since then, continuous researches by many nations have come close to completing a reconnaissance of the continent and its surrounding oceans. But the geopolitics of or in regard to the Antarctic has of necessity been characterized by a high degree of mutual cooperation, collaboration and accommodation in various degrees and at various levels. The Antarctic Treaty signed on 1-12-1959 after 18 months of long deliberations between 12 states which participated in the IGY, including United States of America and USSR, reflected this accommodation. The Antarctic science provided a successful base for the treaty. The thrust of the 14 articles of the treaty is to ensure that freedom of scientific investigation and peaceful uses of the continent are maintained. The present membership of the treaty consists of 20 consultative parties, namely USSR, United Kingdom, USA, India, Japan, New Zealand, and in other states, 50 or more permanent stations established by 16 countries operating throughout the year. India has two permanent stations. The U.S. has spent more than 180 million U.S. dollars per annum on Antarctic research. More than 1,000 U.S. personnel work in and around Antarctica. Similarly, United Kingdom, Australia, Argentina, FRG, New Zealand, Chile, USSR, have been spending large sums of money on the Antarctic research program. In several of these countries, institutes of Antarctic research or polar research have been established. Antarctic minerals regime. There is a wide range of opinion concerning the likely location of hydrocarbons and other mineral deposits in Antarctica. The final session of the Antarctic mineral resources was held from 2nd May to 2nd June 1988. Representatives of 20 consultative parties, including India, and 13 non-consultative parties participated. As a result of their deliberation, the Convention on the Regulation of Antarctic Mineral Resources Activities was, was signed on 2nd June 1988. It opened up ratification on 25 November 1988, and several countries have already ratified it. Thus, the technology for exploration and exploitation of mineral resources in Antarctica is being developed. The concept behind such a technology is being pursued actively by several countries. The economic viability of Antarctic resource exploitation, hydrocarbon, that is oil and gas, and other minerals is becoming more and more certain, and its potential use is much talked about in the world these days. India started participating in the work of this group on the minerals regime after it acceded to the Antarctic Treaty in September 1983. In view of the complexities of the issues and other problems involved, the establishment of an acceptable minerals regime for the Antarctic resources is undoubtedly an important advancement towards using the Antarctic resources for the benefit of mankind. India is a signatory to this regime and has contributed very substantially. The last meeting of the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Party, which was held in Paris a few weeks ago, has developed conflicting ideas about exploitation of minerals in Antarctica. Many nations believe that Antarctica should be left behind as a global nature's reserve, but many nations are going ahead with the exploitation of Antarctic resources. The Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine this Living Resources was concluded in 1980. The convention deals with the rational use of and conservation of Antarctic marine living resources, seals and whales, and also many other endangered species. Nearly 22 countries and the European Economic Community have signed this convention. Of these, many states have ratified the convention. The convention entered into force in April 1982. India acceded to this convention in July 1985.
Now, India's interest in Antarctica. Increased scientific activities became the basis for negotiations of the Antarctic Treaty of 1959. Beside the parties directly involved, many other countries started looking at Antarctica with interest. As early as 1956, India made a formal proposal for including the question of peaceful utilization of Antarctica on the agenda of the United Nations General Assembly. But the initiative did not receive favorable response and the matter was withdrawn. Again in 1958, India asked the question of Antarctica to be inscribed on the agenda of the United Nations General Assembly. And at the 13th regular session, considering the strategic, climatic and geophysical significance of the continent as a whole. After the treaty came into force in 1961, the question of India's accession was raised. But the presence of South Africa in the Antarctic Treaty system was considered to be an embarrassing factor. Meanwhile, the possibility of dispatching scientific expedition to Antarctica was also examined. Although some suggestions were made during 1974 for sending an expedition to Antarctica, but the matter was not pursued further. Between 1980 and 1982, the question of India's accession to the Antarctic Treaty was examined once again, and India's options were considered. In July 1981, it was decided to send the first Indian expedition to Antarctica while keeping the options for joining the treaty open by stepping up our scientific research activities. The question whether India would experience any legal, political, or practical difficulties in continuing its scientific activities in Antarctica without acceding to the treaty was also examined. It was also speculated whether India would be able to explore and exploit the, the resources of Antarctica without being a member of the treaty and whether it should seek consultative status if it were to join the treaty at all. Since the Antarctic Treaty is open to all members of the United Nations, it was felt that the states which are not parties to the treaty should have no difficulty in having an access uh, to or in conducting peaceful scientific investigations in Antarctica. But only 15% of the Antarctic area is free from claim. There are seven countries, namely Argentina, Australia, Chile, France, New Zealand, Norway, and United Kingdom, which have territorial claims in Antarctica. These claims have been frozen after the signing of the Antarctic Treaty. USA, USSR, India, and 10 other countries are non-claimant states. However, the consultative status could be acquired only if in terms of Article 9 of the treaty, substantial scientific interests were demonstrated and were accomplished. The first and second expeditions undertaken during the summers of 1981-82 and 82-83 by India were intended to achieve these objectives. Accordingly, the question of India's accession to the treaty with a consultative status was decided by the Cabinet Committee this on Political Affairs on 13 July 1983, taking into account the scientific, political, and economic objectives. Since the primary focus of the treaty is on the promotion of scientific investigations and not on resource exploitation, the emphasis was on the scientific and political objectives. The living resources regime and the ongoing negotiations on minerals regime were taken due note of and India's options for participation in them were kept open. Although it was not possible to visualize at that time the outcome of negotiations on the Antarctic minerals resources, it was considered that with a view of safeguarding India's future interest in the Antarctic resources, India should continue and step up its activities in Antarctica. It was decided that India must project its scientific achievements in Antarctica on behalf of the developing world to counteract the fears of the developing countries, the heads of the state and the governments of 18 developing countries were informed by the late Prime Minister, Shrimati Indira Gandhi, to the effect that India will not do nor allow others to take any step which would be considered detrimental to the interests of the developing countries. To sum up, therefore, India's approach and policy has been to undertake and foster scientific research in Antarctica 
with a view to providing a realistic basis for the assessment of resources to protect the interests of developing countries to the extent these are politically feasible and desirable, to ensure that Antarctica is used for peaceful purposes only and remains a nuclear-free zone. The existing mandate of the Antarctic Treaty comes to an end in 1991. There is already a rethinking about widening the scope of the Antarctic Treaty system as a whole. We have been able to conduct excellent science in Antarctica in the, in the disciplines of geology, geophysics, glaciology, meteorology, ozone depletion, atmospheric science, microwave propagation, solar radiation, oceanography, and human adaptation. Preliminary studies made on the nature and abundance of bacteria and other and macro plants in the Antarctic waters, ice, and lake waters became useful and uh, became very important for the study of the origin of life in, on this planet. Primary production studies carried out showed that the Antarctic water shelf and other regions are highly productive. The studies on land biology included primitive plants and animal life such as algae, green, blue-green, and other forms of algae, lichens and ticks and mites which are found in the ice-free areas either attached to the rocks or under the rocks. Nearly 40 species of birds have been recorded from Antarctica by the Indian scientists. Several species of seals and whales have also been studied. The most abundant marine life in Antarctica is the shrimp-like krill on which all forms of bigger animals are dependent. Krill is also known to be the largest unexploited food resource in the world. Some fishery biologists believe that 40 to 50 million tons of krill can be harvested every year without depleting these stocks. In the field of engineering, the geotechnical properties of the soil in ice-free areas were investigated and studies were conducted on rock mechanics. Similarly, the properties of different types of materials used for the construction of buildings and which have been exposed to severe Antarctic weather conditions for several years have also been studied. As we know, Antarctica has peculiar weather conditions with 24 hours daylight regime during the summer and total darkness during some months in winter. The wind speed could easily go up to 100 kilometers per hour during blizzards which are very frequent in Antarctica. Temperature as low as minus 56 degrees Celsius has been recorded at Dakshin Gangotri. Thus the use of non-conventional sources of energy such as solar and wind become very important. We have successfully installed and tested solar energy photovoltaic modules and have also installed a 12-blade horizontal axis wind electric generator for the generation of power in our buildings. We have also attempted to conduct some experiments on horticulture. Thus, several Indian vegetables like potatoes and tomatoes have been grown successfully in small greenhouse chambers in Antarctica. The effect of prolonged exposure of severe cold and isolation in the Antarctic was studied on human psychology, health, and human behavior. These studies confirm the excellent adaptability of the Indians to the Antarctic conditions. And to put it, as the foreign press has said, and I quote, when the Indians reached Antarctica in 1982, we were not sure that they will stay on. But from the impressive progress they have made in their installations, we are now fully convinced that they have more or less mastered Antarctica." Unquote. This statement very rightly summarizes the quality of work we have been able to accomplish in Antarctica. Another question which is often asked is whether we will ever be able to colonize Antarctica. The answer is that the peninsular region of Antarctica has become very well populated. There is such a concentration of stations in that area that the treaty countries are advising several countries to move out to other regions. Similarly, the question of promotion of tourism in Antarctica is often being debated. During the last eight years, 
tourist traffic has increased substantially in Antarctica despite the fact that several treaty countries have been discouraging the visit of tourists. Several travel agencies have been running luxury liners to Antarctica bringing in tourists to the peninsular regions. Adventure tours for photographing the wildlife and for getting an exposure to Antarctica are also becoming frequent. At our Dakshin Gangotri station, we have an Indian post office and a branch of the Allahabad Bank. The Indian base is being regularly visited by the Russians, East Germans, and various other nationalities. And whenever they visit, we stamp their passports. Thus, India's achievement in scientific research in different disciplines have been well recognized by different countries. During the last eight years, more than 250 original scientific papers and reports have been published on Antarctic science. Out of this, about 40 publications are in international journals. Polar science has grown very rapidly in our country. You must remember it's only eight years old. Although it is eight years old, there are more than 20 institutions in India which are now working on the data, material, and samples collected from Antarctica. In Calcutta, also there are several institutions. Thus, the Antarctic program has been a unique example of cooperation in Indian science. Benefit of Antarctic research. Benefits from the Antarctic research to the country are many. First and foremost is that the Antarctic program has made it possible for us to build a team of persons capable of working in extreme cold and difficult conditions. By their untiring efforts, the first-hand knowledge about Antarctica has been obtained. During these expeditions, we have been able to test a number of indigenous equipment and other materials in the Antarctic conditions which would not have been possible otherwise. A major breakthrough was made through the use of containerized accommodation in Antarctica developed by the Defense Research and Development Organization, DRDO. As a result of the experience gained, the container type of living accommodation has been improved considerably over the years. The experience gained in Antarctica has been successfully utilized in strategic areas of our defense needs. Rich experience has also been gained in the methods of erection and construction of buildings in extremely hostile weather conditions. We only have 40 days to work in the summer for our building work. And in this period, very large buildings have been erected in Antarctica. The design and development of special clothing, footwear, tents, and other accessories needed for the survival and stay in Antarctica are now being used in the frontier areas of our defense forces. One of the important benefits has been the establishment of long distance communication link using indigenous material and equipment. Our telephone system, which was established more than six years ago, has not gone out of order even for a single day. We also have telex and other forms of communication system. Construction of helipads, operation and maintenance of vehicles, and the indigenous methods of development of various items processed and cooked food, etc., have been a very valuable experience for our future defense needs. It has also been possible to acclimatize our men to operate vehicles in difficult and unknown trains. Similarly, the treatment and disposal of waste material, according to international standards, have been an entirely a new experience. In the field of meteorology, the benefits have been significant. It has been possible to make timely forecast and issue warnings both for navigation and scientific investigations in Antarctica. Another significant benefit is the understanding obtained about the possible relationship between the seasonal variations of surface temperature over Antarctica and the occurrence of rainfall in the tropical regions. Glaciological studies undertaken during these ex expeditions have provided a basis for studying the relationship between the Himalayan and the Antarctic glaciology. No other country in the world has so far undertaken such a study. 
by virtue of the Antarctic expeditions, we have built up personnel who are capable of navigation and position fixing in difficult and unknown trains. Our safety record in Antarctica has been simply outstanding. We have sent 600 persons in eight expeditions so far, and all have come back safely. No one has fallen sick or has suffered any serious injury. Our continued operation in Antarctica have facilitated exchange of scientists and data and information related to Antarctica with the other countries which have interest in this continent. One of our scientists has spent one whole year in an Australian Antarctic station. We have been able to provide surgical treatment, virtually an operation, appendix operation, to a Russian at our station, Dakshin Gangotri. Similarly, one Russian doctor has spent several months at the Indian Antarctic Station, Dakshin Gangotri. Another Indian scientist has been selected for an expedition to the South Pole by the U.S. team. Our Antarctic stations are excellently equipped. Besides living and working accommodation, we have excellent library, well-equipped hospital, recreation facilities, games and sports, and in all respects, we have a mini India in Antarctica where people come from different states of India, speak different languages, eat different food of their own choice, and listen to different music and see video films in different languages. Our Antarctic station provides logistic support to various scientific teams in the form of timely forecasts and warning. In the Antarctic program, 30 institutions and the three services of the Defense, Army, Navy, and the Air Force and the DRDO have been able to carry out outstanding work. And all the logistic support they have given to us is simply unparalleled. This program has been a unique example for us. In my concluding remarks, I would say that the frozen continent of Antarctica at which we used to look at only a few years ago with mystery, awe, and fear on the atlases, wall maps, and globes of the world is neither Since mysterious radio, uh, nor recorded. intimidating anymore to the Indians. We live and work most, most comfortably in this continent throughout the year and carry out our work during the winter at temperatures reaching below minus 50 Celsius. Antarctica is a beautiful part of our Earth, most promising and rewarding. And therefore, it must be studied by us, by our children, and by our grandchildren. It holds a great future for the mankind. It is a no man's land, yet it belongs to everyone. I have yet to find a person who had been to Antarctica once and would not like to go again. There are several Indian scientists who have been there three to four times. And during the most difficult winter periods also, they have lived three to four times. And they want to go again. Out of the three women scientists who have gone there, Dr. Aditi Pant had been there twice. And Dr. Sudipta Sen Gupta is going again this year. Such is the charm of that unpolluted and uncontaminated continent. And such is the enchanting landscape of Dakshin Gangotri, calm, serene, pure, and most inspiring. In my concluding remarks of the Sardar Patel Memorial Lecture Series, the title of which I have kept, Ocean, the Future Hope of Mankind, I would like to add that oceans hold the greatest promise to mankind for the future. From the foregoing account, which I have summarized yesterday and today, it is abundantly clear that in whatever area of human activity or endeavor we look at for obtaining life-sustaining resources, whether it is food, fresh water, living space, minerals, including oil and gas, energy, climate, transport, communication, recreation and tourism, etc., the sea plays a crucial role. So crucial is this role that it is difficult to escape the conclusion that the age we are entering now is not only going to be the age of the atom, the electron, or space, it is also going to be the age of the sea.